Good morning, everyone. Welcome to the Green Mountain Care Board meeting. My name is Kevin Mullen, Chair of the Board, and uh, we're going to get started with the Executive Director's Report. Susan Barrett. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I have a few announcements. I want to first start uh, by letting folks know um, of our change uh, regarding um, our physical location for public meetings. As many of you know, the state of emergency declared in 2020 in response to COVID-19 expired on June 15th at midnight. As a result, the temporary measures enacted by the Vermont legislature and tied to the declared emergency also expired. This means the board, <laughs> the board must have a physical location available for the public per Vermont's open meeting law. I want to note that presenters and board members will be participating in all of our public board meetings remotely through Microsoft Teams, at least through September 1, 2021. Members of the public can attend all meetings at the physical location at 144 State Street in Montpelier or through the Microsoft Teams application or via our call-in number. All of this information is located on our website under the board meetings tab. And if you have any questions, you can reach out to Abigail Conley or myself. I also wanted to uh, just update folks on an ongoing public comment, which you've heard before, but I will reiterate that we are currently taking a public comment for a potential subsequent agreement with CMMI for an all-payer model. We've been doing that for several months. We've been sharing, obviously, those public comments with the board, but also with our partners at AHS and the governor's office as they are taking the lead on the potential next agreement. And then uh, there are two other public comment periods that um, were ongoing and have since closed. Those are on the ACO budget guidance as well as the vital quarterly budget. And um, our presentations this afternoon will address those public comments. And that is all I have to update the board and public on. Are there any questions or do you have any other comments on that, Kevin? I think there's uh, one additional public comment period, which is about um, Clover Health, um, which is uh, available now for any public comments through the 29th. And uh, we'll be hearing from Clover Health this afternoon. And so, um, Again, that public comment period is open now through the 29th, next Tuesday. Um, I just want to make clear that um, despite the um, Secretary of State's um, release, some people have interpreted that, that um, everything is going back to in-person, and that is not the case. So that uh, at least through September 1st, uh, all of our meetings will still be um, remote, except there's the physical location offered to the public to attend. And we'll have two staff members at that physical location to assist the public so that if they have comments at that time, they can do so. Um, but it does not mean that uh, um, the board or the presenters will be there in person. So we'll still be operating as we have been operating, but just making sure that we have that actual physical location, which will be our office space, the large conference room at 144 State Street. So again, um, don't read more into it than than what is there. <laughs> yeah. And with that, yeah. Susan, I'm actually going to turn it back to you to sure. introduce our um, guest speaker this morning. Um, it's always exciting to have a, a national expert come in and uh, share um, views with us. And so, Susan, if you could introduce our, our guest presenter. I will. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And I um, I am excited uh, to introduce Eric Shell. I did want to turn it over to um, Elena Beerby just to have a few words um, about uh, the connection to uh, Eric Shell's talk today and the work that the board's doing on sustainability per Act 159 of 2020. And then she'll turn it back to me and I'll introduce Eric Shell. So Elena. Great. Yeah, just a few sentences. So, um, you know, per Act 159 of 2020, the board was tasked with working with Vermont hospitals to ensure that their sustainability as we make this shift from fee-for-service to value-based 
care. Um, and so with the support from Vermont's Program for Quality and Healthcare and the Office of Rural Health, um, we've invited Eric to come speak with us and, and um, you know, particularly with his expertise in, in rural health care, um, you know, to help us think through some of these intersections between payment, um, payment models and the shift to value-based care and population health um, and, you know, what our providers really need to be sustainable through this transition and into the into the future. So um, we really look forward to um, having a deeper conversation today and learning from Eric. And also, um, you know, we've done a lot of thinking together over the last couple of weeks as he's gotten up to speed on, on what's happening in Vermont. So um, we hope that everyone will take this opportunity to really um, be thought partners in this really exciting and innovative area. So thank you. So thank you, John Olson, for making this possible too. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> and our partners at VPQ. Um, so I'm just going to uh, give a little bit of background on um, Eric, his impressive background. And I think you, you'll hear that there's a lot of ties to what Elena teed up in terms of sustainability and rural health care. So I'm very excited and we are very excited to hear from Eric Schell again. He was last year in April of 2019. Um, suffice it to say, it's, it was a lifetime ago, <laughs> not, not to mention the pandemic, but also um, the impacts on some of our hospitals here in Vermont. And um, I, I think the bankruptcy at Springfield happened after his talk. Um, so we've we've really experienced quite a bit here in Vermont in terms of uh, the impact on um, rural hospitals. And so we are very excited to have him back to to give us a national update on some of the things he talked about with us in 2019, as well as some as well as some of the issues that Elena raised. Um, just as background, uh, Eric has a, a is very dedicated to improving rural communities. He's an industry leader in supporting rural healthcare in its transition to population health. For his nearly 30 years in healthcare financial management and consulting, Eric's passion for sustainable and accessible rural healthcare has driven him to help hundreds of rural health systems achieve improved financial and operation, operational performance. As healthcare transitions from fee for service reimbursement towards value based payment, Eric and his rural team provide vital strategic financial and operational improvement services to ensure that rural health systems continue to provide local, high quality and accessible patient care. He's a noted speaker with a commitment to education and he's, and he's often featured at rural conferences nationwide, presenting on the future of rural healthcare, critical access hospital financial and reimbursement topics and rural hospital performance improvement. Eric has assisted in the development of a national program for rural hospital performance improvement and performance measurement. Further, he helped develop new rural demonstration payment programs for frontier clinics and hospitals. Eric has served on the National Rural Health Association's Rural Health Congress and Government Affairs Committee and the Federal Office of Rural Health Policy's Rural Hospital Issues Group. Before joining Stroudwater, Eric was the Director of Finance and Administration for Rochester Community Individual Practice Association, Inc., where he provided leadership and financial management to a 2,500 provider, 2500 provider community-based IPA. He has also practiced as a CPA, CPA at Arthur Anderson and & Company and at a local accounting firm. So as you can hear, he's very well versed in rural healthcare and rural hospitals and also um, going to inform us on where we are now nationally um, and what we can do in Vermont to pay, pave a way forward. So I'll turn it over to you, Eric, thank you. Well, thank you, Susan. Note to oneself, shorten the bio. Um, <laughs> uh, I didn't know how many times I could say rural, but I did it all. <laughs> Well, I'm assuming I'm, I'm home with most of us here as Vermont is a somewhat rural state. So um, um, first of all, I want to thank the Green Mountain Care Board for having me back to Vermont um, virtually this time, unfortunately, and um, discuss one of my true passions, which is which is is it's ultimately creating a true healthcare system in the United States and not just a sick care system. And so um, 
Um, you know, as, as Susan just mentioned, you know, two years have passed since my uh, April when I was last out in Montpelier and, and talking to you. I remember snow on the ground. Um, and, and um, you know, while so much has changed um, with the pandemic and uh, you know, there's so much that has stayed the same. And, and so um, um, just just being part of this conversation is, is incredibly rewarding to me. So with that, uh, there's several topics in this presentation that, that, that we want to kind of talk about. Um, the, the first is kind of the future of, of, of healthcare and rural healthcare, you know, where the industry is going, why, and, and what do we have to do uh, to be successful as it transitions. Um, this was, uh, you know, a lot of this is a shortened version of what we talked about uh, two years ago and updated for current affairs. Um, the second is, is to, 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 to really think about a vision for the future. Um, and I will tell you, both both of these first two portions of the talk are, are, are presentations I've given around the country outside of Vermont. Um, and 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 um, um, so so they're really this this you know, where it's going, why, and then the vision for the future, national talks. Then we're going to drill down and to get into Vermont specific, you know, kind of what my findings were um, and, and um, you know, how they relate to what I see as this future vision. And then, um, and then, and then, finally, we'll offer some considerations. Um, uh, you know, I'll, I'll say this right out, um, and I'm going to say it again at the end. Vermont is the leading state in the in the United States around the transformation to value-based care and a true healthcare system. Now, there's nobody close to you, and um, um, you know, and and so we'll we'll state that. But you know, are there some tweaks that we could do? Absolutely, uh, and and uh, and I've got some ideas around that. Um, my 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 one caution, and and you know every good CPA is going to start with a qualification. Is that over the last thirty days, I've been drinking from a fire hose with all that you've been you have got going on in Vermont, and try to get off to speed in thirty days, um, and have a life outside of um, you know just study is is is, is <laughs> there's a lot you guys have a lot going on, and um, and and so you know I may miss on some things. I may not be one hundred percent perfectly accurate. Um, but it's 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 more. Let's pay attention to the tone and the direction of of what I'm saying, rather than the specifics. If I miss something, call me out. But um, let, let's hope it doesn't get too bad. Um, so so with that, why don't we why don't we start the presentation? Do you have that up and running? Um, uh, is that Alina or Susan? Somebody? I'm Who's Alina. gonna fire that? Who's gonna fire yes, that? I'm gonna fire. <laughs> and I'm back up in case Alina runs out of power. <laughs> And and thank you to John Olson for helping support this this project. Good to see you. Uh, so so uh, you know it's the Shaky Bridge. So that's where we are. So so um, this you know I like to start off with a call to action. I guess this is the first part of the talk. Why the where the industry is going and why and at least from 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 this accountant's perspective in Portland, Maine. Um, and 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 so the first call to action slide is is this one right here. And and this is the the um, um, the uh, the Kaiser Family Foundation su survey of health plans last year that the 2021 study is not available. I checked yesterday; it's not available yet. But it shows this stepwide increase in uh, the, the family premium for commercial health insurance, um, where now insurance premiums are $21,000. The, the the stark um, uh, uh, that amount is stark because it's now a third of the average household income in the United States, and 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 you know at what point is it is it going to be too much and is it going to be consuming too much of the GDP? Uh, the second point is is that that you can see a stepwise increase um, in this payment system or in the in the total premiums or costs going into our healthcare system. Now, basic laws of supply and demand would say that as price rises, we would have dem demand decrease and supply increase. And I will suggest to you that, that because of the cost, the price that has continued to go up, we have, we have allowed or we have invited in uh, you know, new supply that, that we're going to talk about here in a minute that's 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 almost unheard of and and it's going to really kind of change rock our world so you know again th there's a couple important pieces of this the one the stepwise increase uh, and with you know i don't see any end in sight um uh to this the supply and basic laws of supply and demand and and the offering that we've we've allowed the entry in new 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 supply into delivering services um and then the fact that that we're a third of household family income, and at what point is it too much? So first call to action slide. 
Next call to action slide, please. Uh, the second is, uh, this is, this is again from the same Kaiser Family Foundation employer health benefits uh, survey from last year that shows that the, the, the dark blue line is the, the, um, the um, um, average small firms, and I, I like to point to this because it's most of what's rural Vermont are the small firms of, of health plans that high, have high deductible insurance. It used to say, we used to say, I don't know, 10, 15 years ago, that as soon as we could attach consumption consumer consumption decisions to their hip pocket, we would solve this healthcare cost escalation. And, 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 and so now we've got 42% of, of small businesses that have some, their, that their commercial insurance has this, this tie-in of the hip pocket, the wallet to healthcare consumption. And have we solved this cost escalation in healthcare? I point back to the prior slide and suggest not. Next slide. The, the overall decline in 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 inpatient admissions, um, you know, th th this is this is significant because um, uh, and, and and what's funny is you're the only uh, state in the union where there has been no decline at all in inpatient admissions <laughs> because you guys have been healthy forever. It's not like Mississippi where everyone eats fried food. Um, but uh, anyway, we've had a, a 10% decline in inpatient admissions between 2008 and 2019 from, from an industry perspective in the United States. Um, and, 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 and those projections are expected to continue down. Um, you know, our, our payment system, this fee-for-service world that so many of us kind of have mastered over the last 30 years, is a payment that says price times volume is net revenue. Um, when we have a big piece of our volumes, i.e. the inpatient side, especially for the larger academic medical centers, that, that um, when, the, when the price, or excuse me, when the volume side of that price times volume is net revenue equation is going down, uh, you know, things get to be challenging unless we can increase the price. And I would suggest to you is outside of the critical access hospitals, you know, over the last 10 years, um, because of the Affordable Care Act, there has been a the price escalation by your by your biggest payer, i.e. Medicare, has been will give you your cost of inflation less, and it was less 0.75 for I believe the last six years. Now that's finally gone away a year ago, but but so what what we're seeing from the Medicare, your biggest payer, is that they're, they're going to get price is going to be cost escalation, inflation less 0.75. In other words, price relative to cost is going up. So here we are looking at this world of price times volume in the fee-for-service world is net revenue, where you have a big chunk of volume, i.e. inpatient volume, heading down, with the exception of Vermont, um, and price relative to cost by your largest payer going down. This bodes trouble for that fee-for-service world. Next slide, please. And 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 here, um, this is the perfect storm. I look at the perfect storm that is happening. Um, this accelerating growth in technology. And in the next couple of slides, I'm just going to point out a couple of cases of where this is the true. Um, I look at the perfect storm as you know, kind of this. It was a it's, it's a three part whammy. Um, the first is that because our price escalation in in the total cost of healthcare has continued to go up on a stepwise increase. And again, we've enabled this additional supply. So, so we've offered in this whole new industry to, 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 to our, because of the higher costs. The, the, the second piece of, this, of this, this, this perfect storm is the accelerating growth in technology that has enabled um, these new entrants to come into our industry. And then the third, really, I look at it as the pandemic. And the pandemic from the perspective is that we've gotten, as a, as, as, as a consumer, we've gotten com comfortable with online technologies to access pieces of our healthcare system. And so with that perfect storm, um, next slide, please. I just got a couple of, of kind of, you know, interesting market updates here that are all leading to, to challenges to this world of fee for service. Uh, I look at this one as a major impact. United Healthcare um, back in April when they um, when when they're buying Optum Care was 56,000 physicians, and they want to grow this to a hundred billion dollar business, mostly through value based contracts. Uh, that's you know there's a whole bunch of words on this slide, but it's it's as we move people into value based pay arrangements, there will be a major driver of how we're moved to a hundred 
billion book of business. I mean, that 100 billion is going to come out of somewhere. And, um, uh, you know, it'd be interesting to see where it comes out of. So the first thing is, is the insurance companies are, 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 are getting much more aggressive about getting in on the front end of value based pay payment. Next slide, please. Uh, CVS and, and, and Aetna, right, and, 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 and kind of what they're moving. They want to have 65 billion healthcare transactions over the next 10 years. A big piece of that strategy is the growth of their health hubs. Um, you know, in, in 2020, they opened 650 health hubs, and they're on track to open 1,500 by the end of 2021. Um, they're offering both in-store or in-person and virtual services. Again, direct competition to what we've been providing as an industry uh, for years and years and years. Next slide. Walmart, Walmart uh, um, acquiring this um, MeMD acquisition, and 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 the big piece of this is that that um, it's it's um, it's it's ultimately a virtual healthcare um, system for for Walmart. Well, now Walmart is saying, hey, we're going to be in in health centers within stores. They have freestanding health centers in in Georgia, Texas, Arkansas, uh, uh, in Chicago, um, direct to consumer telehealth through purchased app. Um, Telehealth partnerships with Doctor on Demand. Um, you know, all of this is is Walmart jumping into this business as, as this new te technology emerges. Next, next slide. And 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 this is frankly the one I you know this is the the spirit I fear the most. Um, uh, you know, Amazon and. Um, you know, Amazon. You know, ultimately, they 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 have, their, they have this the health product called Amazon Care, and 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 earlier this year they announced they were moving into primary care outside the workforce. Um, they they have two components to this Amazon Care. Um, one is 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 the virtual where they want to connect um, patients or you know you know consumers to a health you know say a, a health. You know, somebody who they can take care for their health needs within 60 seconds. And then their goal is to have within 60 minutes, uh, if someone needs to have a, have a home visit, have somebody at their homes. Now, that home visit is only offered in some big cities right now, but they're looking to roll this out nationally. Um, just as of last week, there was an update in Fierce um, Health Care that said that their, 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 one of their executive VPs talked about the fact that this Amazon Care now has multiple corporate accounts signed up with it. And on a per-click basis where the patients have access to, to online within 60 seconds, a provider, um, the in-home is going to bring a bag of technologies where they're going to be able to do lab tests and, 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 and other type of diagnostic procedures in the patient's home. This right now is, is, is scares me. Um, next slide, please. And, 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 and <laughs> it was interesting because, um, you, know, a, you know, back last year, American Hospital Association came out with a study that said in 2018, for the first time in 35 years, the number of emergency outpatient visits declined within our hospitals. Now, it was interesting because this third bullet down the report, I'll read it, it says the report cites that the amount of outpatient care delivered has most likely increased, but that care is being delivered in competitive um, new options such as urgent care and retail clinics, such as those recently launched by CVS Health. And, you know, this was in 2020. So now Amazon and, and, and Walmart and all of these other services that are just going to continue to stack up against our hospital business. And again, you know, we live in this world of, you know, primarily in this world of price times volume is net revenue. That's fee for service. And, and next slide, please. And, and here's what we're starting to see. Now, this is uh, the, the green line is, is Vermont's outpatient visits per thousand uh, population. Um, you can see back in 2009, we were at 5,400. We're now at 48. 100, 48, 48, um, uh, 48, five, five, four, you know, 4,900, for example. So we've seen some of this decline already taking place. And, 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 and this is the number starting to play out as, as would be predicted by the emergence of technology. Now, this is only through 2019. And it'd be more interesting to kind of fast forward 24 months to see the impact of some of these new entrants that we talked about. So next slide. 
And so ultimately what we're seeing, and this this came out of the MedPAC report that was just released a couple months ago, um, is, is that we're seeing these. So the, 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 the orange is um, Medicare margin by for rural hospitals, including the critical access hospitals. The blue is the rural hospitals excluding critical access hospitals. And the gray is Medicare margins for all hospitals. And you can see this downward trend since 2013 that that I would suggest to you is is both um, the the you know this this world of price times volume is net revenue when price relative to cost for the all but the critical access hospitals is going down, and 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 price relative to cost is going down, impacting both dimensions of price times volume equals net revenue. Now the uptick, yeah, uh, you know, if you read the MedPAC report in 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 a couple of months ago, the uptick is related to some upcoding and inpatient codes, as well as the some of the benefits of the 340B program, which is a discount drug program many providers are are participate in. So, next slide. And then just a kind of kind of uh, you know kind of a couple more pieces of of why. This world of fee for service is in demise. Uh, um, uh, Dr. Liz Fowler is the new director of Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Innovation, and um, she was speaking at the American. Um, um, uh, oh, uh, it was a uh, the ACO annual ACO conference, and and some of her comments are very. Um, are very important for us to understand. And the first is, is, is it's, in the, it's in this blue caption, we can't have fee-for-service remain a comfortable place to stay. In other words, we've had a change in administration and the new administration is just as much on board with changing payment as the prior administration. Um, they're, 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 the, the Dr. Uh, Fowler's comments really are around saying, hey, you know, we've got to come up with innovative models that meet the needs of the providers where they are, rather than trying to just put out a whole bunch of stuff that may or may not be working. And so, but I think that first comment is, uh, we can't have fee for service remain a comfortable place to stay is a super important thing for all of us to take to the bank. Next, next slide, please. And 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 then and then last year's MedPAC report that came out in June again you know, around you know MedPAC is the group so it's Medicare Payment Advisory Council they advise Congress on payment um, kind of kind of pay payment changes and uh, they hit on a couple really important pieces one is that 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 um, um, that, that value based payment especially through the ACOs is going to be a really important part of how we're going to kind of have the Medicare trust fund be solvent in the future. And so I just wanted to put that up there. So next slide. So 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 really this call to action, to summarize the call for action is, is fee for service. There, staying in fee for service is not a risk-free enterprise. Uh, fee for service is, is being threatened by a number of different counts, both fundamental economics, um, it, you know, it changes in in, in um, kind of payment policy. All of these things are causing um, this 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 fee for service world to change to value based payment. Good thing you you all in Vermont are well aware of this and are moving. Um, we're going to have to always continue operational efficiencies, human and 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 um, 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 clinical integration are going to create advantages. We're going to have to continue to seek out clinical advantage. And then ultimately flexibility. We've got to ingrain flexibility into how we design and move forward into value-based payment. So next slide. So 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 where's the payment going? Um, again, again, this is the national the national talk. I'm going to drill down into Vermont in ten minutes or so. But um, the, the 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 you know this is the, the patient value. The new kind of driver, the the equation for driving value is is patient value. That's going to be the new competitive force. And it's a metric that says quality over cost applied to a population. So anything that we could do to improve quality, holding cost constant, anything we do to drive down cost, um, holding quality constant, increasing the population that this equation applies to increases patient value. This is the new competitive driver. I look at an accountable care as a payment system. Um, and, and, and think about it as a payment system, not from an ACO perspective, but as a payment system where a providers monetize the value derived from increasing quality, reducing cost. In other words, provider organizations will benefit from increasing quality and reducing costs. And it takes the form, it takes a number of different forms um, from bundled payments, value-based payment programs, 
um, self-insured health plans, Medicare defined ACOs, capitated provider sponsored healthcare. All of these are opportunities where if we can bring increased quality, reduce costs, applying it to a larger population, we create patient value, the new competitive driver of our healthcare system. Um, and, 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 and I think about accountable care as a payment system is different. It's different than managed care. Um, you, you think back uh, 15 years ago to the managed care era, and, 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 and we think about who monetized the value of increasing quality, reducing or increase, decreasing costs applied to a larger population. For the most part, it was the health insurance companies, not the provider organizations, whereby the provider organizations had the greatest ability to affect quality and cost. The second piece that it's different from the managed care era is the government's all in. And, and um, back in the managed care era, I mean, I was an active participant in all of that. Um, you know, we were doing all of this monkey business around gatekeepers and PMPMs and withholds and all that for 15 or 20 percent of our business. Now with the government all in, especially all in in Vermont with the all payer model that you have, um, it, it's a very different equation. The economics are very different. We have new information systems to manage costs and quality. Uh, back in the day when I was at the IPA in Rochester, um, you know, we had to wait six to nine months to have any claims data to, to present to the physicians to show if they save money or not. And that's changing. We've got a new science to base decision making on. And frankly, going back isn't an option. And if you heard anything I said in the call to action around the continued increase and escalation of costs resulting in increased supply, and then with the new technologies and the new market entrance, I hope we understand that going back is not an option, is not an option. And, and so, so with that, let's, let's, go, let's go forward then. I, I, I like to think about this as, you know, again, Vermont for the most part is a, is a, a rural healthcare delivery system. And, 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 and I look at rural, um, th this, this whole ACO relationship to small and rural hospitals. I think rural hospitals have incredible value in this new world. And, and um, um, a big piece of that is that is that the revenue streams of the future are tied to the primary care physicians and their patients through attribution. You all in, in Vermont have, have really written the book on, on this through, through One Care Vermont. And um, um, so, so and, and the reason why that, that, that really hit me, uh, specific to the ACOs, is back when the ACO regs originally came out, gosh, almost done, probably nine years ago, I remember I was reading the regs and, and, it, and, it, and, it, and it said this, it said, a uh, primary care physician can belong to one ACO, hospitals and specialists can belong to multiple ACOs. And, and that really struck me as, oh my gosh, this is why our rural health systems have so much value in the new world. Because so many of our rural hospitals are built around a primary care-based delivery system. The thinking is that if, you could, if, if, if a primary care physician can only belong to one ACO, then those are the revenue centers of the new world. You can only attribute revenue to one case. You can't spread revenue around. Uh, expenses, on the other hand, hospitals, specialist technology, they become expense centers in the new world. And, and, um, um, and, and so with that, the rural hospitals and their, and their primary care-based delivery system have incredible value. And again, I would say for the most part, all of Vermont is this rural health care delivery system in which primary care are the basis of your strength. So small hospitals with their alignment with PCPs with a, um, that are highly efficient and have high quality, which many of you do in Vermont, you very high value in this new world. Next slide. And just, just to briefly compare and contrast the fee-for-service world with the population-based or the accountable care payment system world, I always like to just show you this because it, it, it points out um, you know, kind of some basic concepts um, around the fee-for-service world. So, so if we look at the L and X, the, the L and X ax, uh, or, or graph right here, what you have is, is across the x-axis, you have volume starting at zero, going out to the right, increasing volume. Um, on the, on the y-axis, you have, again, starting at zero, going to the top is dollars. If we just look at a, a, a health system, really any health system's cost structure, at zero volume, we have very high cost. Right. We have very, very high costs. I mean, we've got to staff our emergency room. We got to staff our inpatient units. So all of our, all of the, the 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 departments we're staffing. Our administrative costs. We have very high costs. But we have one additional patient admitted to the day, 
our costs are only going to go up a tiny bit. Um, in Pennsylvania, with the, um, you know, I was working with all the rural hospital or many of the rural hospitals in the global budget model down there. And um, there was an analysis done that showed their, their, their true variable costs are only about 15 cents on the dollar. So what that's saying is that if, 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 if our inpatient, you know, if we, if we admit somebody to our hospital today, our costs may go up 15 cents on that revenue dollar. So what happens is, and on the other hand, on the revenue, on the orange line, which is your revenue, every time we admit a patient, we get paid $2,000 a day. So $2,000, we admit a patient, we get $2,000, our costs go up 300 bucks. Um, and, and what's gonna happen is there's this incredible incentive to drive up volumes because of that, that, that fixed variable cost equation. Your, your, rev, your cost curve is gonna go up only slight amounts for incremental increases in volume where your revenue curve is gonna go up. So the fee-for-service world, there was an incredible incentive to push out volume and increase the slope of the payment line because increasing the slope of the payment line said that we get paid a lot more per unit of service created. Uh, the result there is, is what do we have there? We have you know, new offerings of more technology, more services, more higher end services, neurosurgery, cardiothoracic surgery, cardiology, orthopedics, all because we get paid more. So the fee for service world that we're moving away from created these perverse incentives uh, around sick care. The, the, now let's move to an accountable care or a population based payment. How do we increase our revenue? Well, we increase it by attributing more lives. How do we attribute more lives? It's through alignment with our primary care base. Um, you know, I always like to, to kind of throw around numbers. You know, the, the average per capita health care cost in the United States is about $10,000. Maybe it's a little less in Vermont because you guys are so healthy. Um, and, 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 and a busy primary care practice with 2,000 patients in their panel is 2,000 times 10,000 is $20 million. So, so, to, to, so to, 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 to figure out how to grow revenue in a population, it's not about providing more sick care, it's attributing more lives by offering value. It gets back to that value equation. Um, our cost structure, on the other hand, our cost structure, many of the costs that were revenue centers in the new world become cost centers. And those are technology specialists and bricks and mortar. They all become cost centers. And so, you know, this, this world, there's very different incentives and, 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 and opportunities to grow revenue and manage expenses in that new world. So very, you know, comparing and crafting fee-for-service and population health, very different uh, um, in, in incentives. Next slide. Okay, this is the, the worst slide you've all ever seen, and you probably remember it from the talk two years ago. But there's, it's so important because there's there's you know three or four major concepts that that we have that, that are important to talk about. Uh, the first is so this over on the left, this this bluish pillar, that's a pillar, and it's a pillar of payment, and it's a fee for service pillar. And let's say it's 2014. Actually, Vermont, it was probably way before then because you guys have advanced by 2014. And in this fee-for-service payment system, it's a pillar because it was a perfectly aligned delivery system and payment system. The more sick care that we do, the less health care we do, the more we make. And ultimately, we have to make something in order to support our payroll and, and keep our hospitals and, and health systems vibrant. And so you had a stable platform. On the right-hand side, you have a stable pop platform. This is a population-based payment system where the payment and delivery system are completely aligned. The more healthcare you do, the less sick care you do, the more you, the, the, your financial benefit, your financial gains. A uh, couple problems is, you know, first of all, this fee-for-service payment, based on all the things we talked about in the call to action, is smoldering. Price relative to cost is going down. Um, the the um, volume is being taken out of the system, overall trends in inpatient volume, and now new trends in outpatient volume. And all of a sudden, this price times volume is net revenue when both price relative to cost is going down and volume is coming out of the equation is threatened. The risk of fee-for-service exists now. Um, over, you know, and, and so the problem is we just can't step from this st stable but smoldering pillar to this pillar over on the right because we don't have a healthcare system. We have a sick care system. We take care of sick people really well. It's going to take us years to create a health, a true healthcare system 
where we've invested, you know, in, you know, some proportion of our total sick care resources now into truly creating health care and, and at a community level. So it's going to take us time. Let's put a number on that. 2034 is, is that time frame. And, and everything in between is, is kind of schizophrenia. For example, as the payment system of fee-for-service starts to dwindle, as we move more to population, as the population payment starts to emerge, um, you get to year 2026, I would say in Vermont, you're in it now, it's 2021, where your feet are right above the crocodiles. And your feet are right above the crocodiles because half your delivery system says we need more fee-for-service volume. The other half of your fee payment system says we need less fee-for-service volume. We need more health care. And what do you do with your doctors? What, what's the message to your providers, your care team? Well, you know, commercial insurers, they're still paying mostly on a fee-for-service. Uh, so let's maximize utilization. Let's, let's maximize the incentives of, of, of the sick care fee-for-service payment system. But for Medicaid, and in some cases, Medicare, we're under a population-based payment system. Let's minimize utilization. It's schizophrenia. Um, and, and so you know, this piece right here is danger land um, until we can start to figure out how to move our feet above that more towards here. I would say there's only one health system in the United States that's actually figured out this world of this population-based payment system, and it's Kaiser. Kaiser literally says, we're successful when our hospital beds are empty. Next slide. So, 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 so several years ago, CMMI, Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Innovation, came up with, they, they said the payment system is going to evolve over time. And as it evolves, it's going to take on different characteristics. And, and I lay these out because I want to go back and forth. So, so the first, this is fee for service, right? And that was the category, that was the blue pillar on the left that was stable until price relative to cost is going down and utilization is coming out. Then we have category two. This is a column of payment. This is a payment system that's kind of where many of us are right now for many of our payers. For example, many of your commercial payers were still in this world of fee for service, but now with links to quality and value where there's pay for reporting, there's pay for performance, there's foundational payments for infrastructure, you know, PMPMs for primary care. All of this is fee for service with links to quality. This is, a, a, this is a, if you were to graph this on the prior slide, the, the, the crocodile slide, it's still to the left of the, it's, it's to the right of the, the fee for service, but it's to the left of the feet right above the crocodiles. The next word, the next category, alternative payment models built on a fee-for-service architecture. This is schizophrenia. This is feet right above the crocodiles, danger land. And, and this is where you have alternative payment models with shared savings, with uh, shared savings with some downside risk. For the most part, most of your payers in Vermont are in this category three, which I consider right in the danger land. And um, because again, we, our, our accounting systems within our provider organizations are still measuring performance, their financial performance based on claims. Claims are uh, claims are, is revenue for, for most of our systems with the exception of your Medicaid program. And as, if claims are revenue, then, then anything that we do to take out claims reduces our financial performance and puts us in financial jeopardy. Once we get out to here, this is where we have population-based payment on a population-based infrastructure. We're recognizing in our income statement and in our financial statements, revenue and bottom line, the residual claim of health. In other words, if we get a total cost of care payment amount, if we're able to keep our patients, uh, you, you, know, you, you, know, um, you know, we're able to reduce that cost we can take a residual claim. If we're if it's $10,000 and we can deliver that for 9,000, there's $1,000. That's the residual claim of health. And, 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 and again, I think there's only one payment. This is the green pillar on the right. So these are the payment systems as they merge over time. Next slide. I promise we're gonna get to Vermont here in five more minutes. Uh, <laughs> um, uh, and, and so, you know, we've always gone with this premise and this is where we're gonna twitch twi um, twist things around here in a minute. We've always gone with the premise that the form, we organize ourselves around the functional imperatives of the payment system, of the financing system that exists. 
And, and if we think about the functional imperatives of a fee-for-service payment system, right? The functional imperatives of a fee-for-service payment system are managing one's own price, one's own utilization, and one's own cost. If we can get paid more for the sick care that we do while we manage costs, an organization acting in solo can be very successful in fee-for-service. And so the form that evolved out of that was independent organizations competing with others for market share and volume. Form follows function, follows payment. As we move to these accountable care payment systems or population-based payment systems, the functional imperatives become very different. The functional imperatives become, we're trying to care for the entire population, both healthcare and sick care needs of an entire population. So we have 20,000 people around um, you know, Springfield, Vermont. There's 20,000 people in the, in the service area. We, we can't do that in the isolation of just a hospital. We have to have a medical staff. We have to have post-acute care. We have to have public health. All of, these, the, all of these pieces, ambulance, become pieces of caring for, we have to have tertiary care, um, become pieces of managing the entire health care and sick care needs of a population. The second is we have to accumulate lives to diversify insurance risk. And, and, and so two functional imperatives of this world of population-based payment, leading to a forum that says aligned organizations competing with other aligned organizations for covered lives and new competencies required, network development, care management, risk contracting, risk management, all pieces of the form of, uh, the, of the form that's going to require, um, that's going to drive the functional imperatives to be successful in this new world. Next slide. And so, you know, um, several years ago, working with four critical access hospitals in, in, in Vermont, uh, we came up with this as a, frankly, it's, it's, it's what we consider the vehicle for how we move across the phases of payment. Um, this is how healthcare organizations should be thinking about this transition from, 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 from volume-based fee-for-service to population-based payment. So let me just quickly explain this, and then and then we're going to kind of change around the conversation. Um, so so the, if we think about the pillars of payment going across the top, you can see it says fee for service. It, this is that 2014 model of payment that is smoldering at this point. Phase one, this is the CMMI Centers for Medicare and Medicaid. That column one where you have fee for service predominantly, but with now quality and uh, tie-ins to quality utilization control. This is where many of us are today for most of our payers, even in Vermont. Phase two is the feet right above the crocodiles. The feet right above the crocodiles because you have alternative payment models built on a fee-for-service architecture. Anything that we do to create health looks really poorly on our financial statements. And finally, as we start to lift our feet away from the crocodiles, we go to the phase three of payment. The phase three of payment is we start to emerge out and we transition to alternative payment models or population-based payment models built on a population-based um, infrastructure, leading to what we consider the future where you have provider-based health systems. You have the Geisingers, you have the, where, where you integrate sick care, health care, and payment under a, a constant umbrella. Again, I'm going to tie this back to the Vermont very shortly because you have a lot of these pieces in place, which is super exciting to me. Um, so, so those are the phases. So think about this as time, right? 2014 on the left, the fee for service, 2000, PBPS is probably 2030, and then the phases as they evolve. There are there are three strategic areas the health systems have to address coming down the y-axis. The first is the delivery system, and there are three initiatives to make sure that we transition our delivery system, our sick care system. The next is the population health. We have to create a population health system. And we have to do that um, kind of moving from phase one, which is crawl, walk, run, sprint. We can't come out too quickly and create health care too quickly while we're still getting paid predominantly in fee for service because that creates you know, really bad results. And then the third strategic area we have to address and transform is our payment system and proactively pick up and pay, pay the trans, uh, um, pick up and move payment system. Um, again, three strategic areas. There's strike points, the implementation, the orange bar is strike points. 
So coming down, what are the delivery system? What are the key pieces of the delivery system have to do? Well, today, if we're in phase one of payment, fee for service with tie-ins to quality and utilization, moving to phase two in Vermont faster than any other state in the union, um, we've got to make sure we have high operating efficiencies, quality, patient engagement, and we got to do that today. And we've lost 138 rural hospitals already in the last 10 years or 11 years that haven't figured, they haven't gotten there yet. Um, we have to align with our primary care, fundamental alignment with our primary care. And I would suggest to you, just because you employ them does not mean you will align, you're aligned. Fundamental alignment with our primary care. By the time we get to phase two, I would suggest that in, in Vermont, this is something that's absolutely critical for everybody right now because we're right there. Um, but today, we've got to make sure that we're planned for that. The um, Phase three is uh, service area rationalization. What this is coming together in larger systems to care um, so that we can, by the time the payment system gets out to phase three, we can start making, you know, kind of decisions around resource allocation of where it's best to, as an entire statewide or system, to invest in healthcare resources and sick care resources. Um, and so these three pieces are the keys to transforming our sick care system as it exists today. Again, our healthcare system, we've got to create that. The first blue box, and it's a strike point because there's orange bars around it, um, you know, patient-centered medical homes. You guys in Vermont wrote the book on this. It's so incredible that you've done that. Care management, data analytics through One, One Care Vermont. You guys are starting to really accumulate data here. Um, Evidence-based protocols, we're starting to work on that. So think about crawl in phase one. Uh oh, next slide, next slide. Unless you're telling me I need to go faster. <laughs> <laughs> uh, uh, phase two is uh, payer network contracting, which you guys are already starting to work on, hotspotting value attribution, coming up with that funds flow model for the hospitals, the health systems. And again, plan design risk, you know, all of this is crawl, walk, run, sprint. And finally, we've got to pick up and move payment. And, and again, you guys have done a really incredible job here. So right now, where the initiative one at the bottom, it's hit the orange bar or strike point. You have our health self-funded health plan. Do we take the our entire population of our self-funded health plan and 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 um, you know roll them into our care management um, um, strategies? Um, you know, maximize any fee for service quality and utilization. The next is transitional payment models. This is moving to um, you know the strike point is out very close to where you guys are in Vermont where it's low risk ACOs and those types of things. Finally, full risk cap plans, which for your Medicaid, many of you are in at this point. So, um, but I look at the, the, the future as these, you know, this, these initiatives are absolutely critical for health systems to implement um, each, each one. So everything that we implement in column one is, is, is a twofer. It maximizes the world that we exist in today, the fee for service, and it positions us for phase two. Every, once the payment system gets to phase two, it maximizes phase two of payment and then it creates an option on phase three and et cetera. It also breaks down this nebulous concept, this whole transition framework breaks down this nebulous concept in, of population health into bite-sized pieces that health systems can really move forward with and implement. And finally, it keeps, yeah, it keeps everything in check. And so um, with that said, now we're gonna get into a little bit of vision for the future. Next slide. And so this is where, again, a national talk. This is in 2014, I, I was on, on a flight. I was, giving, I was speaking at a conference in, in, in Hawaii uh, to the rural health systems out there. And, um, and I started thinking about it. I said, maybe we have this wrong. Maybe this premise of form follows function follows payment is not correct. Maybe what we ought to be thinking about and at the time in 2014, I called the it's a Vision 2020 for for Hawaiian healthcare, and and I, I modified this obviously for Mont. And then we're going to take I'm going to go through these few slides and then tie it to what you guys are doing. Um, so so the vision and and I had to change it from 2020. I was very optimistic for Hawaii. Um, uh, they've done nothing is what you they aren't anywhere on this map. But, but let's call Vermont Vision 2030. And isn't a vision uh, Vermont health systems partner with their community to improve the health of their community while preserving appropriate access to the high quality sick care that we currently offer. Let's flip the plan. Let's take this thing and flip it upside down. Next slide. And here's what I mean by flipping this upside down. You know how we talked about the premise being form follows function follows payment? Forget that. Let's take payment and set it aside. 
Let's move it to the back. It's the caboose now. Let's say, what is the function that we want out of our healthcare system? Define that, figure out what the form is going to be, and then after that, figure out how to pay for it. And so as I started thinking on this long flight ride to, to um, Honolulu, I started thinking, okay, what is this function? Well, maybe it's health systems partnering with their community to improve health of a defined population while preserving appropriate access to traditional care. And new things, chronic disease management, increased relevance of our health system in healthcare. You know, the, the social determinants of our health, our healthcare systems are a fraction of the total de de determinants. Uh, because we don't get paid for them. We only get paid for treating sick care. If we figure out a way to get paid for healthcare, could we be more relevant in, 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 in healthcare? Um, access, the, you know, again, the, the second function, access to appropriate and right-sized traditional patient care, right care, right time, right place, right provider. A common set of evidence-based protocols across the industry. And quali uh, quality and patient safety are absolutely, it's high quality. When you come into a health system for sick care, it's as high quality as you could possibly achieve. What are some of the uh, common requirement, or the requirements in order to achieve this function? Well, we need a common vision, vision for healthcare of Vermont, a common between the providers, the payers, the government, all of these, a common vision. Well, uh, you know, so again, I'm talking about a national talk and I'm going to lay on what you guys are doing. <laughs> and a payment system that provides incentives for true health care. Next slide. Uh, so, so now let's talk about form. It's kind of shaded there. Yeah. So we talked about function. What's that form going to look like? Well, we're going to have to have aligned providers. We have to have centralized decision making around resource allocation. So we need high level of integration. Non-traditional partners at the table, public health, mental health, wellness, and I would think government possibly as part of this. Um, we need primary care with patient attribution that's part of this form. New roles for health systems, claims analysis, network contracting, risk management, risk contracting. Again, I want you all to start thinking about what you guys are doing in Vermont and how much your guys are doing in Vermont ties back to this vision. Integration of payment and delivery system functions. Some of the requirements. We have to have enough lives to diversify insurance risk. Centralized decision making to appropriately right size the sick care system, and a common information technology platform among providers and 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 stakeholders. And so, if we're going to achieve the function that we want, this is the form. What is the payment system going to look like? Next slide. Well, the payment system is going to have to be. You know, the the key requirement is that that that. It has to fund necessary access to health care while preserving traditional patient care. What does that mean? Well, the payment incentives cannot preclude health interventions. And if you think about the fee-for-service world, by definition, it precludes health. Now, we like to say every one of us in our, in our health systems have a mission statement around improving the health of our communities, but that's not what we're paid for at this point. Payment systems cannot, approve, cannot preclude access to appropriate patient care. We still have to maintain this high quality healthcare system that we have within our state and within our country. We have to have a financial reporting to reflect income for both healthcare and sick care. We have to show in our income statement that when we improve the health of our population, there's a credit on our income statement. What are the requirements? And this is in this humble consultant's opinion. Nearly 100% global payment to healthcare providers based on attributed population may require healthcare providers to assume insurance risk. Uh, a financial reporting method is to be adopted to new payment methodologies, and i.e. a credit on the income statement for improved population. And then new cost centers are provided budgets to manage within. And again, in the world of the future, budget, you know, your cost centers are bricks and mortar, technology, and specialists where your primary cares are your revenue, your attributed lives. Um, this is the finance. So the next slide, please. And then, so what are the short-term imperatives? Um, proactive approach to determine vision for Vermont healthcare, um, led by the highest levels within our state government. Um, it was interesting to see uh, um, the governor's comments uh, yesterday on, on um, related to the, the, the um, the report by the, the state auditor on, on um, 
on the accountable care organization and Medicare and, and just see how committed the governor is to transition to population and accountable care type payment models. Um, healthcare providers to accumulate scale and centralized decision making. Um, develop care management organizing framework, PHO, or we could say ACO, clinically integrated network. We have, we have aligned medical staff. We have claims analysis capabilities in partnership with commercial insurers to ensure pilot population payment models. These were the short-term imperatives. Again, this is a national talk. Let's talk about Vermont. Next slide. <laughs> so what are you doing in Vermont? What is the state doing? Uh, I, I, again, I am humbled by what you have done and what you are, are going to be doing in the future. Um, I've, 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 I've only listed four transformational efforts that are going on, and, and you know, I could probably fill the rest of the slide deck with some of the efforts that are going on, starting with the Blueprint for Health launched in 2023, which was, it was in the Department of Health, DIVA, um, um, uh, with a mission of integrating a system of healthcare for patients, improving the health of the overall population, improving control over healthcare costs, um, by promoting health maintenance, prevention, care coordination, and management. Um, Patient-centered medical homes, uh, community health teams, hub and spoke assisted treatment. All of these are initiatives um, made payment decisions for patient-centered medical homes. All of these are pieces of that vision that we just talked about. And that started in Vermont in 2003. We have the Green Mountain Care Board who we're, we're, we're presenting to right now today. I, I think, you know, in terms of a regulatory body, um, with with a, with a goal to improve the health of the population, reducing per capita rate of healthcare costs, enhancing the patient and healthcare professional experience of care, um, you, you essentially the the um, you know kind of recruiting, retaining high quality healthcare professionals, and achieving administrative simplification. Incredible goals of the Green Mountain Care Board. Um, um, regular regulations of, of 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 charge setting and those types of things, and then and then beginning in 2020, um, increased financial sustainability of Vermont. So again, I call both the Blueprint for Health and the Green Mountain Care Board transformational efforts. Next slide, please. The third strand transformational effort is the the all payer ACO model, which is a five year demonstration ending in 2022. Um, wow, all payer um, uh, model. Um, you know, allows Medicare, uh, Medicaid, and commercial insurers to shift payment from fee for service to the alternative value based payment systems. Um, with your Medicare ACO, um, you know, we have a goal of cost containment of 3.5%, but no more than 4.3%. And, and there's scale criteria, and we're increasing the scale. Um, really, really an amazing effort. And then finally, One Care Vermont. Where, where a lot of the pieces that we talked about in that vision and the short-term imperatives around accumulating providers, and um, I, I see what you created in One Care Vermont, um, you know, incredible progress towards achieving some of that vision. Um, so, so a community of healthcare providers driving system change, uh, improvement by leveraging innovation, information, informa uh, investment, access, and education. It's the only one in the state has total cost of care targets with payers for both upside downside risk um, and then and then nearly all and then all health systems are participating but each each health system can you know their participation in programs i.e payers is optional and I'll, I'll talk a little bit about why I think that that's that's that that's a tough one you know at least if we're going to achieve the vision but anyway four statewide transformational efforts, that you guys are as close to anyone in terms of the pieces. You have all the pieces out on the table and it's ready to put them together. Next next piece, I'm just gonna to touch on the, the provider organizations, um, 14 hospitals. So you have a manageable size of, of, of health systems working within the state. Um, one academic medical center, five PPS hospitals and eight critical access hospitals. Only three are in a system relationship with, with 11 independents, which is very rare as, as I'm seeing in states now, as, as we're seeing an incredible roll up um, uh, ac uh, across the country. The, uh, um, the BRG, uh, a study that they pr produced said that they have adequate bed, there's adequate bed capacity in the state with possibly some incremental capacity out past 2026, but overall decent bed capacity. But but here, you know, again, call to action. This 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 
con the consistent decline in operating margin between 2015 and 2019 that, that we really have to kind of get our um, um, arms around. And, and part of the reason why that act, uh, what was it, 159, um, was so important around financial sustainability within our um, health systems. Next slide. From a primary care perspective, um, um, the mix of employed and private practices with many FQHCs and our rural health clinics. Um, a majority of the providers are employed in some health systems. And then with your new pay with, with your patient, most are participating in your patient-centered medical homes and some payment in the form of PMPM. All oh, great, great opportunities for you. Next slide, please. You have payers. Uh, this this uh, this graphic here is a breakout between uh, you know if, if you look at your your inpatient payment broken out by Medicaid being the green black is Medicare fee for service uh, the the uh, blue is blue cross blue cross and you got MVP and then you got other commercial so you have inpatient payment outpatient payment just some key characteristics of what I think are important around the the um, the the payers your commercial sub funded. Um, they represent 36% of inpatient payment and 58% of hospital outpatient. Um, it's reported that there's uh, significantly higher inpatient outpatient commercial rates than Medicare and Medicaid, which results in providers pri prioritizing fee-for-service payment mechanisms to maintain operating margin. That's in my opinion. Okay, that 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 you know I, I'm looking at a, if I'm the CEO of a health system, and I have to maintain margin, in, and I'm seeing my margins decline. That that with my commercial rates higher than Medicare or Medicaid, um, and again it's that fixed variable cost equation. That if I can generate additional outpatient or inpatient um, um, uh, patient volume, if I can get more than that 80-20, it's it's going to work out very well for me. Um, the Blue Cross Blue Shield um, Vermont and MVP are participating with the One Care ACO. They're providing some um, th uh, uh, per member per month to help support population health management activities. Really good stuff. Um, the, the, the challenge I see, and, and we'll talk about this, is, is that, the, that these commercial payers are primarily paying fee-for-service claims to the hospitals. Again, you know, our hospitals are recognizing income based on claims. That's sick care revenue. Um, with year-end settlements, but um, um, on, on, a, on a total cost of care budget. There's only shared savings, so there's not downside risk, and it's 50-50. Again, I consider the 50-50 split a challenge, and we'll talk about that in a second. Um, and um, there, is a, there is a Blue Cross Blue Shield um, um, a pilot program with a health system where one of the health systems receives nearly a, a, a monthly fixed payment with no reconciliation to claims. Next slide, please. Um, the self-funded health plans representing a significant portion of commercial insurance. You have large, many, many, many um, organizations that have self-funded insurance, many of which are using Blue Cross Blue Shield as their third-party administrator, TPA. Um, um, you know, it was reported that, that you know, the, the self-funded plans, they're, they're generally, uh, you know, there's an interest in moving to developing value-based contracts. It's just that there's not a lot of sophistication to deal specifically with the nuances of a contract. And, and there may be an opportunity there for improvement. Next slide, please. And then we got Medicare, 46% um, of inpatient uh, payment, 29% uh, of hospital outpatient payment. Um, the hospitals can elect to participate in all payer ACO, which results in them accepting risks tiered to their covered lives. So One Care Vermont accepts 100% risk with a 5% risk corridor. Um, in 2021, eight Vermont health systems participating in the Medicare ACO. Critical access hospitals are paid on a cost basis with settlement to costs, while the prospective payment and academic medical centers are paid on a straight fee schedule. Um, the hospitals or health systems are not required to participate in the ACO. Um, and, and frankly, a barrier to the rural hospitals participating is their inability to accept risk for their covered lives. Um, the big challenge here is that that rural hospitals generally only receive between 30 and 40 percent of the total cost of care as revenue to them. If they're taking responsibility for the 100 percent, the risk on 100 percent total cost of care, there is immediately and there's a challenge there associated with that. That you, it's tough to take on risk for 100 percent when you're only receiving, let's say, 35 percent of the total payment in terms of revenue to you. Um, 
Independent primary care providers can participate in a comprehensive payment reform in which providers receive a monthly per member per month. Again, the federal government is moving in this direction with their direct contracting model and, and some of the, the, the chart um, models. Um, um, and and so, so, so really good stuff. Reported that nearly 50% of independent primary care practices are participating in this per member per month payment, which I think is absolutely right on. Next slide. Uh, and then and finally, Medicaid represents 18 percent of hospital inpatient, 12 percent of hospital outpatient payment, um, fixed payment to one care Vermont for all Medicaid lives um, with one care Vermont paying hospitals a fixed capitated payment based on attributed lives. Uh, total cost of care negotiated between one care Vermont and, and Diva with a risk reward quarter of four percent. Um, attributed Medicaid lives have increased from 29,000 to 111,000 in 2021. Way to go, Vermont. Um, um, so the, 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 the risk, though, so the hospitals are receiving fixed budgets. The risk reward is based on the fee for service. About 50% of, of the total, total cost of care is in fee for service. Some paid to out of state providers. Um, and then and then some paid to physicians and those are outside of the budget. And that's about 50% of the total cost of care. Um, and like Medicare, independent primary care provi providers can, can elect to participate. So that's your payer, that's your provider environment, that's your payer environment. Next slide. These are, these are my last really two or three slides. Um, I, I look at, you know, just, just setting back. And, and again, my mindset is that vision that we created, you know, flipping around the transition framework to say, what if we started with the end in mind? What if we started with function um, leading to form and then figuring out how to pay for it? And given all that you guys have done in Vermont, beginning in 2003 with some of the governor's initiatives in the blueprint, uh, you, you know, here is just my observations. Um, one is, and I stated this at the beginning, you are the leader of all states of the transformation from sick care to health care. I, I am blown away with what you have, what you're done and what you're achieving. Congratulations to everybody that's been participating. Um, the vision, um, vision established with buy-in from highest level of state government providers and payers, right on. We have a payment system aggregator, One Care Vermont, which enables consistent payment to all providers. Um, you know, we talk about all payer, all, um, you know, all, all, all payer, uh, you know, all payer systems. I think what's important is all payment systems are consistent. And you have the, 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 you have the foundation through One Care Vermont to have consistent payment to providers. I would say this, let the health plans compete on attributes of health insurance but as long as we can have a consistent payment system that, that, that meets the needs of those that, that function that we want to achieve, we've got something to work with. Um, we have a comprehensive payment system well underway. However, I consider these some challenges. Small rural hospitals generally paid between 30 to 40 percent of the total cost of care are unable to accept risk of total cost of care. Again, we talked about this just a few minutes ago. If I'm only receiving 30 cents on the, on the revenue dollar, in other words, the total cost of care is $100. If I'm only receiving 30% of that, but I'm required to take risk on all, 100, on all $100, that, that risk as a percent of my $30 is significant. And so I think I consider that one challenge right now. And I understand why some of the rural hospitals want to sit out and say, hey, you know, I, I, you know, my, I can't do this. Uh, the numbers don't work. Um, commercial plans requiring 50-50 gain share with no downside risk, along with payment to providers based on fee-for-service, promotes fee-for-service payment across the entire system. And again, it gets back to that fixed variable cost ratio that if health systems, let's just say on average, you know, I, I told you I quoted Pennsylvania, the about 15% of variable costs, 85% fixed, but let's just go with the 80-20 rule because that sounds better. So let's just assume a health system has 20% of its cost is truly variable, 80% are fixed or step fixed. Um, if we can't get the commercial insurers to have at least some form of 80-20 gain share, then the incentives for the hospitals are continue to maximize the fee-for-service payment system. 
because anything they do to take out healthcare when they're losing 80 cents on that dollar, right? They're losing, they, they, they can reduce their costs. They, they take $1 of, of sick care utilization out of the system by taking, by getting incentives for health. They can take 20% of their costs out, but the 80% are gonna remain. And so that is one of the real challenge to this. Uh, the second is that for a majority of providers, fee-for-service payment, whether it be from commercial, the claims, whether it be they're not accepting fixed payment from, from Medicare, they're receiving you know, claims basis and settling to costs, as long as that fee-for-service payment exceeds that 20% fixed variable cost threshold, that variable cost amount, thus then providing sick care is going to predominate. It's, it has to, because even if we had, let's just say we had 50% of our payment in the form of healthcare, uh, excuse me, in the form of, of population base, the other 50%. Again, it, the hospitals, if they take any of that, if they, if they take any sick care utilization out, they're not gonna be able to take out that 80% of fixed costs. So there's two pieces of it. One is the health plans that are going to have to have a different um, gain share. But the other is that we've got to move more of our payers into accepting fixed payment or some type of a global payment away from claims. Um, um, or we're going to have continue to have in incentives for sick care volume. Um, and then and then the optional health system and independent provider enrollment in alternative payment models based on the individual payers and we call those programs. I see those are all, I think all of these points I consider as major challenges. Next slide please and then we'll wrap up. So here's and and I'm only going to offer these as considerations and and again you all are experts in Vermont. I'm 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 coming in um, drinking from a fire hose for the last 30 days and 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 um um, you know, trying to see where you guys are relative to a vision that I see for healthcare. Uh, again, highest level of state to participate in developing vision. Again, hearing the governor and the secretary yesterday in their press conference talk, I think they're on board with this. Um, you know, target 2030 for full transformation of payment. Give providers time to develop that true healthcare system to make the appropriate investments in healthcare. Um, it's it's difficult. Um, you know, if if we have to roll out withholds against all providers, maybe we have to start thinking about you know a half a percent increasing to a full percent over time, increasing to one and a half percent, um, to and then allowing those investments in creating true healthcare. Um, One Care Vermont to aggregate nearly all payer payment and channel to providers, right? So that we have a one payment system. We don't have a one payer system. Um, health systems were required to participate in all programs. Over time, again, 2030 is the vision here. Primary care practices required to participate in comprehensive payment reform. Transition nearly all health systems payment away from claims payment reconcil um, reconciliation towards fixed budgeted uh, payment amount. You know, as long as we're paying out in claims and we're recognizing revenue on our financial statements based on claims, and we have this variable fixed cost conundrum, uh, we are going to be challenged to focus on health until we get nearly all payment, at least 80% of payment in a budgeted amount. Um, critical access hospitals, I think we have to transition from cost payment uh, to budget-based payment. Again, in today's business world, the way we pay for cost centers, you know, we think about housekeeping or we, uh, you know, uh, dietary, we give them a budget and we hold them to that budget. As cost centers of the future, the bricks and mortar, I even think about critical access hospitals. Let's give them a fixed budget payment. Um, uh, total cost of, you know, so you get a fixed budget payment with a total cost of care, shared savings risk with all payers. Um, and that may require some provider withholds. One Care in Vermont as statewide vehicle for payment change must have broader governance representation. It is my belief, and you guys can string me up for this one. It is my belief that if One Care Vermont is going to be the aggregate payer, the 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 the, the, the um, you know single payment <laughs> aggregator that has got to have broader governance reputation than just provider organizations, um, and that and then and the Greenmont Care Board to actively participate in setting uh, aggregate total cost of care and provider budgets as well, ensuring high quality community investment in health related activities. These are the things that I consider are, are you know, and, and, and frankly, um, 
I, you know, pulling together this list, um, then I was recently forwarded um, uh, the, 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 it was a November 19th, 2020 letter. It was called Implementation Improvement Plan. Many of what we have listed here um, marry up very well with that report. So the final slide here, I've gone five minutes over my allotted time, so apologize, Chairman. Um, no worries. It, OK, well, the, the, so, so the fee for service payment systems uh, designed to pay for sick care um, precludes investments or payment for meaningful investment in health care activities, programs or infrastructure. Currently, the function of health care is dictated by finance as the fee for service payment system was designed to pay for episodes of sick care. And that is take that one to the bank. Um, a health care system that starts with the optimal function of healthcare requires both patient access to high quality sick care, but investment in health and wellness activities, program infrastructure to generate healthcare. I believe a global budget payment system maintains a predictable and steady revenue stream so the local health system can maintain access to high quality sick care and invest in community health. A shared savings on total cost of care could fund that healthcare. And with some tweaks, you have the necessary infrastructure to develop a true healthcare system faster than any state in the country. And I key, that's the third time I've said that. Um, you know, I, I don't know if any of you are Simon Sinek friends. He's an author. His most recent book called The Infinite Game, he talks about the, um, um, you know, the role of an organization is to perpetuate itself in order to achieve a cause that, that can't be achieved in its lifetime. Um, that, that, that it's something so compelling that drives organizations forward. And, and he calls this his just cause. Um, I have a personal just cause to see a true healthcare system that's equally invested in healthcare as it is in offering high quality sick care. I'm excited to be participating just in this, even this presentation to see a state in which you guys, this, this my own personal just cause of this true healthcare system is as close to being achieved as anyone. Uh, with some tweaks, you guys are there. And so, um, you know, I, I congratulate you for all that you've done. And I encourage you to continue on the progress that you've made. And, and, and thank you for um, having me come and present today. Truly honored. Back to you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you so much, Eric. And uh, we're going to start with, before we go to public comment, we're going to start with board questions or comments. And I'm going to go in alphabetical order. So I'm going to start with board member Holmes. Jessica. Great. Thank you so much, Eric. Um, super helpful. So much to digest. And uh, it's really heartwarming to hear some kudos uh, for the state of Vermont. So thank you for that as well. Um, so I do have a couple questions, uh, but again, like I said, so much to digest here. One of the things you talk about is service and network rationalization as one of the key factors to the, that successful transition to value-based payment world. And you talk about, you know, ensuring access to appropriate and right size patient care, right care, right time, right provider, right place, all of that has to be in place. So I'm wondering if you could speak a little bit more um, about what does service line optimization look like? in a value-based world in a rural state where you know we have to balance access to services with trying to achieve cost and quality and and really what i'm thinking about here is you know we have a lot of hospitals that are trying to do everything for you know provide all services to the members of their community um, and rightly so understandably so um, but what services in in a value-based world what services do you think should be provided within some close proximity and what services are better delivered at, say, centers of excellence where you can actually ensure that you have enough volume to have low cost, high quality care? How do and how do we get there? How do we start to think about that? Because you talk about, you know, getting there and, you know, we have all these hospitals trying to do everything for their communities, you know, but we have declining populations, volume shrinking, costs growing. How do we do that? So if you could just talk a little bit more specifically about how do we figure out what are essential services? Well, and, and you don't mind if I spend the next 40 minutes answering your question, right? <laughs> <laughs> well, we could have a follow up, but maybe, yeah, because this yeah, is a really so, important to us. We've got to figure this out. So here's here's initially where that service. I told you that we were working with four critical access hospitals in northern Vermont when it originally came up with some of these concepts. And this this was several years ago. And, and there were four critical access hospitals in a two county area, northern, uh, northern New Hampshire. And um, 
the, the question became as they became one and, and, and three, I believe this was the case, three of the four were offering 24 seven general and orthopedic surgery. And, and the question became, as we became one system and we had one all-knowing president, the AKP sitting at the top of this, could we really, do we really need one, four critical access hospitals in a two county area? Or could we have two critical access hospitals, um, you know, maybe an urgent care and uh, you, know, you know, some different bricks and mortar. And then the question became, do we really need to have you know, three gen, full full time, twenty four seven general surgery programs in these in in three of the four critical access hospitals. When we became under one system, and 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 and, and knowing that those were the perverse incentives of maximizing that eighty twenty rule of the fee for service payment system, and 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 the conversation became as we became closer as a system, we could really start to think about community resource planning. Um, you know, matching supply and demand for healthcare. Um, um, yeah, really, just matching that supply and demand for healthcare with with population. So that was that supply um, that that service area rationalization. That you know, big MBA speak for really you know just kind of justifying the need for bricks and mortar specialist technology. Really, anything that's secure resources. Um, now, how do we get there? Um, you know, what we had talked about is that we come together as systems come together where you do have an all knowing voice that could make community resource allocations around investment. You know, uh, Kaiser's figured this out. They have a CEO that sits on top of Kaiser and said, you know, we benefit from the residual claim of health. In other words, if we get $10,000 insurance premiums and we can keep our patients, uh, we can deliver health care and sick care for $9,000, our bottom line is $1,000. And they're showing with you know, billion dollar quarterly profits over the last year or the last two years. Uh, they figured this thing out. We've got to get you know that all knowing president that makes these resource allocation decisions, I, I think is going to be important to this. Again, within the state of Vermont, you guys have some of the infrastructure um, <sighs> Through the you know through all you know, really all four of those transformational efforts that that that, that I've noted to get there, so I only answered about five percent of your question. <laughs> well, I guess let me follow up with um, you know you're advocating for a high level of integration across the system and centralized decision making um, to right size the delivery system and coordinate care, which you know sounds reasonable. But our state is dominated by independent hospitals, and you know local decision making is highly valued. So. How do we, who is this all knowing, uh, you know, omniscient planner that you're describing? I mean, what who, who, is that one care in your world? And, and how do we, what are the strategies to, to you know, make this kind of centralized uh, out resource allocation highly valued? Do you have to have the payment system change before that delivery system is going to change and make that um, yes. incentivized? Yeah. Yes, I think one care Vermont could be as long as the governance. Uh, structure was 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 uh, was um, modified. I think it could be because you do have if all the payment comes into one umbrella, that one umbrella then starts to deciding you know makes resource allocations to maximize that return. And and but it, I do think it would take a change in the payment system at the fundamental at at the bricks and mortar level um, around you know. I, I, I think we've got to move to it's more perspective fixed you know, budgeted payment systems. Yeah. But um, again, again um, lot so much in what I just said, and, and it'll probably you know th there's there's a lot to be considered in that one statement. Yeah, um, and the, with the, you know a lot of our hospitals are critical access hospitals, and you talk about shifting from cost plus reimbursement to a budget based payment. Yeah. Um, uh, obviously, cr cost plus reimbursement, you know, ensures that costs are covered, whereas budget based, you know, uh, budget based payments require far more cost containment efforts, obviously. So how do we actually incent critical access hospitals to want to move to that world where they're well, giving up? Uh, so so critical access hospitals are only cost based to the extent of their Medicare payment, Medicare payment. OK, so let's just say. And if you actually, for the hospitals I've looked at, uh, usually that's only around 35 to 45 percent 
Um, when you factor in the emergency rooms that build on a professional fee basis and you know all the different things that are built, the physicians that are built on a professional fee basis outside of cost-based reimbursement. Um, and so you, you know the, 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 the unhidden cap on cost-based reimbursement, frankly, is, is the rates you're going to get from your commercial insurers because you can't have your costs exceed those amounts, even if Medicare is willing to pay those full costs. So, so that's the invisible cap on cost-based reimbursement. Um, and the other part is, is cost-based reimbursement doesn't co cover the entire Medicare costs. Um, and, and what's, you know, especially on, on the professional side where our costs are going up the most. Um, so I, I think of cost-based reimbursement, let's just talk about uh, on the Medicare side, right? So cost-based reimbursement, if you think about it from a critical access hospital perspective, and, and, and um, I look at cost-based reimbursement as, frankly, a budget-based system with tweaks for changes in volume, right? If, if changes in volume to a critical access hospital result in a 15% increase in cost, essentially 85% of a critical access hospital bu is budget-based anyway with changes. I mean, you know, think of, of, of housekeeping, right? Housekeeping, we're going to give them a budget, hold it to us. But if housekeeping, if we add a new... Um, you know, MOB or medical office building or something, and now they have to care for that building, we've got to add incremental expenses. So I look at it as a budget base, as budget with some variability to accommodate changes. And, and that's why I, I think of cost-based reimbursement as critical access hospitals is a is it budget with changes for 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 small variation in cost differences. Got it. I guess my last question is, as we're thinking about if there's a movement towards building out global budgets and things like that right now, how, how would we start to structure what that budget looks like, right? Right now, our budgets are built, you know, largely on ensuring these cost centers are funded adequately and all of that. But obviously, the, you know, if we want to move to a budget where we're ensuring that essential services are provided, but those are services that are traditionally underfunded right now, how do we think about you know, structuring the base budget to ensure that essential services, primary care, mental health, substance use, disorder, behavioral health, all of those things that are predominantly underfunded now, there's enough funding in the system to ensure that transition and, and there's access to those uh, services in an adequate way. Well, I can speak to my experience with Pennsylvania because I've, I've been working, I, you know, I worked with those folks for about two years representing the hospitals. Um, and 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 their their the way they set their 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 budgets was really based on prior year prior year revenue, and now there were some tweaks going forward. A lot like we just talked about for cost based reimbursement, there were some tweaks that if they could demonstrate the need in a community for a certain service, and that need would pull from the cost going somewhere else, that there would be a transition, there would be a settlement at the end of the year, but but. Um, I would think that you would start with kind of what the payment was in the past. And that's what Pennsylvania, they used 2018 as a base year, trended that forward for either 2020 or 21 based on the hospitals getting in. But, but you know, and it was all, you know, they had about 90% of the payers involved in this. Um, I, I think that one, obviously the devil's in the details on this thing, especially when it comes to shifts in programs and those types of things. But, but I think Pennsylvania did, had, had, had a, has a good thing going there. Okay, great. Thank you so much, Eric. Really, really helpful. Thank you, Jess. Member Lund, Robin. Thank you. Hi, Eric. It's good to hey, see Robin. you again. Absolutely. Um, thanks for coming. Um, I just following up on sort of some of Jess's thinking, I'm wondering if you have any thoughts on Medicare hospital designations and how um you know, I know there's been some movement to to add some new types of designations to to allow for different, you know, emergency room only or hospital at home type concepts. Um, and how might those fit into the future? So I look at, you know, for example, the, the um, uh, rural emergency hospital, right, uh, REH model uh, that everybody in, in Washington, D.C. is promoting. And for critical access hospitals, it would be a disaster, and this in the current payment system. Mm -hmm. um, but a lot like what I just shared with um, with with Jessica was that that um, as we start to evolve the payment, if we get a budget based payment system, and we have resource allocation decisions, then you know again it's the four critical access hospitals in northern New Hampshire. Maybe one of them could have been in a, r a rural emergency hospital, but 
as long as we're getting paid, you know, it's a critical access hospital getting paid on a cost basis where your inpatient unit is 85 to 90 percent cost based. And it pulls a bunch of your overhead costs in again, this claims based cost based reimbursement world. The inpatient unit is going to pull a bunch of overhead into that inpatient unit of which they're all going to get paid on an 85 to 90 percent cost basis. You give up your inpatient unit and you give up cost based reimbursement. What we're doing, you know, the, the, the REH model is paying. It's going back to paying these small rural hospital, rural, rural emergency hospitals now on a straight sick care basis on a low utilization. They're going to give them 105 percent of, of, of APC payment. But but it's all going to be based now on volume. And I look at some of these emerging, these call to action factors that we talked about where emergency services now are, are, are being siphoned off by, by technology. Um, I think it's a very damaging mo um, 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 a model in the current payment system. You guys in Vermont, as you evolve to start looking at budgets and those types of things, I think it's a whole new conversation. Great, thank you. Um, the other uh, sort of issue I think that we struggle with here is cross-border issues, which I'm sure other states struggle with as well. So, you know, we know that uh, a good chunk of Vermonters get the, a bunch of their care in New Hampshire, for example, or in other out-of-state locations. And I'm just wondering if you have any thoughts on that based on your work with other states, um, because I think, you know, it's hard to to really change your delivery system when you're exporting a bunch of your care. I've got one idea. Maybe we could build a big lake between Vermont and New Hampshire. <laughs> um, to start. Um, but again, you know, you don't have, you know, yeah, if nothing no, I, the only thing that's totally say, fine. And, you know, again, my, 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 um, um, my people are going to go to New Hampshire for care that where you have an academic medical center that sits right on the border and there's people going to be in that portion of Vermont are going to cross that river in, in, into into um, into um, New Hampshire for care. I think that can all be factored in as part of the budget setting process, though. Mm -hmm. you know, all payer budgeting that 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 becomes, you know, we recognize that a part of you know, that total cost of care. You know, that's not going to be we're not we're not going to ever be responsible for that. Yeah. Um, and now, now the, 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 the challenge that we have with our friends across the, the, the border in New Hampshire is they're going to still be on a very straight fee for service incentive until we can put them in some type of a budget. So they're they're going to have perverse incentives to what we're trying to do in Vermont. Yeah. Well, thank you. But I um, think the big lake, I think the big lake is going to work best. <laughs> and okay. no, ferries, no ferries between. Anybody know anybody at ANR that can work on that? Um, so I, those were really my two questions that coming out of your talk. I think, you know, for me, I think one of the things that we struggle with here um, in Vermont is we we want we really do want transformational uh, change in our healthcare system. And we love transformational ideas. I think one of our struggles is that we would prefer for that to happen in a, on a two year, within two years and without any upfront investment. And so I think part of what was helpful for me is really seeing that on a national basis, uh, kind of the trajectory for this type of change, the expectation is, you know, 20 years, it's not even five years. So I think, you know, that's something that just culturally, I think we struggle with, and, and this is not just with our current efforts, but certainly with prior efforts around single payer, and even with efforts before that with the Blueprint for Health, which took a decade yeah. to really yeah. be statewide and fully developed. So that's really more of a comment uh, yeah. that was that came to me from your talk. Well, I think the governor kind of talked about that yesterday at his press conference, where he talked about we, you know, if you're going to keep a car for 12 years, you invest in that car. Uh, in, in the early years so that it has a has a has a long and it's it's taking investment in the early years to see the return in the future. And I thought that was a really interesting analogy. Well, I'm gonna yeah, try to keep that car moving so that we can get through uh <laughs> this morning and still have time for this afternoon's board meeting. So thank okay. you, uh, Robin. And I'm gonna turn to member Pelham, Tom. 
Thank you. Uh, Lake Sununu, what do you think? <laughs> For the lake between New Hampshire and Vermont, Lake Sununu. I like uh, it. I, I, I basically have one question following pretty much on Jess and, and, and Robin's approach. Um, the, you know, I, I went through an experience in my early financial life in Vermont where you never knew all the answers, answers, but there was a structure of sustainable spending that the governor had. And, uh, you know, there was a demand that departments and agencies fit within that structure. So, you know, it's it's just not a perfect world. And I, I kind of, my sense now is, as and I think as you've described, is that Vermont over the last few years has built the infrastructure for healthcare reform in Vermont. And so, you know, when the auditor's saying, you know, it's not paying for itself, I say, well, you can't expect it to. We just built the infrastructure, it, but now it is there and it has some experience. And so um, as we head into the next few months in terms of rate review, for uh, the insurers that we regulate um, in the hospital budget process. I'm just curious as to what kind of incremental pressure we should be putting on the system to transition to more value-based payments. Um, the hospitals are at a 14% rate uh, in our last budget process that of their net patient revenue is, is uh, um, fixed perspective, is, is a value-based payments. I'm including the Medicare one that gets reconciled um, to fee for service. The range is, I think, 8% to 22% across the 14 hospitals. And I think that the amount that I've sensed uh, from our insurers that we regulate um, is only about 1% or 2% of their payments mm -hmm. are uh, associated with a prospect of uh, value-based payments. So I'm just you know, do you have any sense, giving you know your presentation where you started talking about your know, changes in technology and and uh, CVS and Walmart and all that stuff going on? You know, uh, what might be a fair increment for uh, rather than just doing kind of an actuarial trends analysis, which we still do, that's saying uh, five or six percent growth. Um, you know, what what might be a uh, a, a, an incremental growth rate that um, moves us toward uh, a higher level of value-based payments, but isn't so demanding that, um, that that there'd be a lot of pushback. It's a very practical question uh, you know, for me, trying to figure out what the path forward is that accommodates a lot of uh, uh, pr provider pressures. So the things that are coming to my mind, and I mean, that's a that's a really difficult question, a great question, but difficult. Um, I, you know, so things that are immediately coming to my mind, and I may be out, out of touch, is that I'm thinking, you know, a, a, a five year plan for, for you know with each of the health systems, you know, you know, you know that we've got to we've got to come up with, you know, okay, what are we going to do with work with each of them individually to move the payment system. The other thing that's immediately um, it's coming to mind is is a lot like the housekeeping example I gave, is that that you know we give them budgets, we hold them to the budgets, but if we add a new MOB, <laughs> we've got to accommodate that. Um, I look at look from a budgetary perspective, the new MOB is you know this you know, potential 14% increase in the cost of drugs that our hospitals are going to have to shoulder the, the 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 huge escalation in the cost of physicians and 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 that we're going to be bearing you know it's like that's the new mob and and, and is there a way to get hospitals on board if we lay out a longer term plan that we have a budget with some flexibility um, that to accommodate you know some of those 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 changes that just you know, with this this who new, new Alzheimer's drug now, and the, the projected cost that that could bring to our 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 industry here over the next ten years. I mean, those are those are that's adding a new MOV. So I, I, I again, I think those are the two things as you were talking, Tom, that immediately came to mind. Um, and 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 for you, the experts in Vermont, you know, you're probably better at answering that. You know, the rest of the the the, the flavor of that question. Well, thank you for that. The thing I would add to, add to that, um, this is not really a question, but it's my favorite topic, which is the Medicaid cost shift, where you have in Vermont, 
Yes, we have full participation on value-based payments in Medicaid, but the payment rate is so low, you know, that that there is this huge cost shift. And uh, I, I think, in you know, in in terms of us working with our our, our state leaders, we need to try to push them to get on a remedial <laughs> plan that uh, it doesn't continue to starve the Medicaid program and allows for some moderate growth that providers can rely upon or a growth rate over the say a five year period that um, providers can, can can rely on. So thank you very much for your presentation. Yeah. Th thanks. Uh, you know, as an advocate of rural health systems, I, I, I hear here to what you just said. I mean, we, we, it, we, we, we there's got to be adequate payment to cover the, the costs and and some of those changes that we're seeing. So thanks okay. for thank you, Tom. And uh, now we're going to move to uh, member Yusufer Maureen. Uh, thanks. And thanks for the presentation. And uh, thanks for all the questions that have already been asked. Um, so I'm, I'm going to take a, a little different angle and ask a question on, you know, both whether we're in a fee for service system or in a value based payment system. At the end of the day, people want to make money. And, you know, in, in both sides, I mean, the doctors are taking oaths, that oaths about, you know, giving the proper amount of care. So, I, you know, in a fee, in a value based system, we can, you know, look at getting the predictable steady income. And, you know, clearly there's a lot of opportunity for, you know, heavy users of the medical system where we can wrap around them services and, and save money, right? Have them not go into the emergency room as much and things like that. But how do we counter the argument of in a fee-for-service world, the incentive is to drive more, right? And and to shift more to maybe commercial payers so that they can make more money. And if you go into a you know a totally a fixed space system, um, the opposite could be true, right? Again, everyone's taking the O's, they're they're supposed to be doing the best for for the patient, but um you might not get all the care that you need. Um, and I've heard that in, in Kaiser at times, right? Where the Kaiser's making money, absolutely. But I know people that have gone through the Kaiser system and they weren't offered the level of care they needed for some very uh, difficult situations, went outside the system, got different recommendations, went back to Kaiser, Kaiser wouldn't do it. And and they you know didn't do the Kaiser way and, 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 and they got better. But, you know, how do we then look at the opposite, which is says if I want to make money and I'm getting a, you know, I'm getting a fixed income stream in, and say I'm not getting the efficiencies on eliminating the specialists or reducing the specialists on on the technology on the bricks and mortar, right? So I still have to make money. Mm -hmm. I can certainly do that by making care choices for patients that I still think are in their best interest, but might be lower cost overall. So, you know, it's just trying to look at what what people kind of counter as the potential opposite. Uh, again, lots to that question. You guys ask multi-layered questions here. I like it. Uh, if, you know, first of all, I, it's not, I don't think we have to we, we have to make money. We're a health system. We have to make money. We have to make a certain return to fund our 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 our, our cost of capital and those types of things. So we do have to be able to make uh, some money, right? So that's that that's number one. Um, and 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 I just want to share you. So so I think it was two or three years ago. I was at State College Pennsylvania, which uh, you know go Penn State. The um, um, and and it was a it was a, a global budget you know meeting of you know all the hospitals had come in CEOs CFOs CNOs and 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 I was part of those conversations and uh, a doctor Clint McKenney who who's at the School of Public Health in Iowa who's also part of the project he led a conversation um, uh, the, the 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 morning of the second day where he laid out and he presented a world, he painted a picture, which, uh, you know, all your hospital budgets, you, you, your revenue is fixed. You, you, you get, you know, 90% of your revenue is fixed. Um, and then he, and, and then he opened up a conversation around what do we do to improve the health of our community? And for the next hour, the ideas that the CEOs and CNOs were raising their hands with enthusiasm to say, here are the things that we do around diabetes management, around, uh, you know, COPD, and here's what we would do to increase health and, and all of these things. For an hour, there was such enthusiasm. 
Um, and, and it struck me as, wow, it just seems like so many of us have got, gotten into our health, into health care for all of these reasons. And because of the darn payment system, we're forced to think that we can only offer sick care. Um, and, and so um, I, I think that the opportunity in the future is around what can we do to take out you know, all of the sick care we do around COPD, diabetes, and all of these key uh, main um, um, sicknesses through creating health. Um, and that's where the money is to be made in the future. Now, again, it's that fixed variable cost, though. So if we take out sick care volume, if everything's fixed, we're only going to be able to reduce our cost by 20 cents initially. Um, you know, you know, and and so that's that's a challenge. But still, um, I, I just think that, that that was just an incredible conversation. I wish everyone could have been in the room to see the energy around that the discussion, to see that there is potential there. Um, then, then the last piece is just around how do we make sure that that you um, maintain the quality and the access and those types of things. And and I think this gets back to when we when I if 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 the if the ACO is going to be this aggregator of payment then you know additional regulatory authority would be you know you know as part of the governance um and and you know in steps whether it be green uh, uh, green mountain care board or some other regulatory body but i think that there has to be that regulatory oversight to ensure that we're providing high quality access to um, our our consumers within the state yeah, no, absolutely. No, thank you. I just want to throw the counter out there and, yeah, you know, yeah. especially with so many specialists in the system. And if we're shifting to some point to have more primary care, that's got to also shift, you know, in the doctors and things like that. But but thank you. It's very interesting. Yeah. Thank you, Maureen. And it's always good to remember that uh, we need the margin for the mission, but we can still have the mission without the volume. So with that, I'm going to open it up to public comment. And uh, I would ask people to um, raise their hands using the Teams format. And uh, before I call on uh, anyone, I want to um, just do a shout out to, I see that Senator Lyons has been on this uh, Teams meeting. And I know that today is a very busy day with your veto session, but um, very appreciative that your leadership is uh, is there and that uh, you have been able to find some time to uh, join us this morning. So with that, I'm going to first call on Jeff Tiemann. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, good to be here. And, and Eric, thanks for your presentation. Your perspective is always valuable and informative, so glad you could join us. I have a question, but just want to make a couple observations first. Okay. Um, you, you began your presentation by saying that Vermont leads the nation on value-based care and that uh, essentially no one else even comes close. I agree with that point, and, and I think it's worth underlining because it represents a lot. It, it includes the investment that hospitals are making, the patients and the persistence that they're demonstrating by staying in this, um, and the commitment that's involved there. I mean, they've stayed in it despite 200 and some million dollars of transformation money not really materializing. So. So I agree that it's important to recognize Vermont's um, kind of often pace setting approach to healthcare, which which goes back decades. I also think it's worth recognizing for context that along with the GMCB, hospitals have pretty significantly reduced their net patient revenue growth um, and their expenses, which has saved Vermonters more than $6 billion since 2011 and still has not compromised the quality that kind of keeps us in the top tier of, of states. Um, and meanwhile, we led the nation's best pandemic response um, mm -hmm. and continued to meet all the needs our patients and, and our communities expect of us. So, so I appreciate your presentation and, and highlighting where our work is leading the nation and where it needs adjustments to make sure it's sustainable. Um, I also want to emphasize your point about Vermont hospitals being different than elsewhere. Um, as you pointed out, they are predominantly rural. They're mostly small. They're mostly not part of a system and every single one of them is nonprofit. Those are distinguishing traits and I think show how we continually do more with less, um, whether that's delivering compassionate care to mental health patients in the ED or vaccinating Vermonters or working on health reform as you talked about. So with that, I just my questions to you are these. In states that are not moving into this space or are doing so really slowly, what is your sense of their hesitation? And then more locally, 
how do we stabilize our hospital finances um, to make sure that we're strong and stable going forward, but also working on the, the premium reduction piece. So um, with that, I'll stop. Thanks so much. <laughs> Jeff, thanks for your comments, Jeff. Um, the, uh, I think the states that haven't been able to get this moving, uh, they don't, you know, it's some of the, 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 the requirements, the short-term imperatives that, that we talked about in the vision. There's no statewide vision um, for having this happen. And, and I think it will take an organizing force um, like the state um, to, 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 to really get people to, to, to do this. I know in Washington years ago, there was a Healthy Washington program where it was a, CMM, a, a demonstration program where, where they tried to get all hospitals on board and they wanted to move 80% of payment into some form of value-based payment within a five-year period. And, and, and I just have not heard anything come out of them that, that is anything close to where you guys are. So, um, but again, it started with the, the, the governor had a, a position paper on this and submitted on behalf of the governor this Healthy Washington program. Um, the, the states that haven't moved, it's it's almost being left up to the providers themselves. And they're stuck in this conundrum of, do you put the payment, do, do you put the function in front of the payment? When you put the function in front of the, you know, uh, the, when you put that optimal function that we want in front of the payment, we're going to get ourselves in trouble. So I think we're just, we're stuck. I think a lot of the other states are stuck until we have an organizing framework to get everybody on board with. Um, and, and that would be, that would be my, my, my thoughts there. In terms of the payment system, I think, um, you know, again, I, I, I do, you know, as I laid out in some of the, my, my considerations, uh, and again, not to go f so far as recommendations, is that you know, we just have to move towards this budget payment where we're, where our health systems are taking that residual claim on health and not being um, uh, not being pulled into the trap of the 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 the, the sick care payment model of fee for service. Um, and 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 I that that that's a tough one for me because it's it's where it's it's people are you know if, if I'm a hospital CEO and I have to go to my board and saying I'm going to move away from what I know generates profit for me to a payment where it's 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 uh, I'll take a budget and then and then I'll try to figure out if we can get health in our community take that residual claim on health I mean that's a that's a leap for me and then knowing it's going to take some time for that to happen so um, uh, but again I, again based on your trans state's transformational efforts and what you guys are doing I think you are, you are in the best position to see to the to my just cause around this true healthcare system. Thank you. Okay, next I'm going to move to Lou McLaren. Hi, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, Eric, my name is Lou McLaren, and I'm the Director of Contracting for Blue Cross and Blue Shield of Vermont. And prior to that, I was the Head of Contracting in Vermont for MVP Healthcare. So I've okay. been in the state for 20 years contracting with the provider community. And nice. I would just observe that um, I think you're overly optimistic, and I appreciate that. I appreciate that you you think we're better than we really are. Um, when you looked at when you put up the slide that talked about the phases of reimbursement, yeah. um, and you had us in the middle column, which was sort of had um, you know alternative payment models with upside and downside risk. Mm -hmm. I would challenge you to maybe research that more thoroughly because without getting into what I would consider proprietary information, I will tell you that that is really not what the commercial landscape looks like. And there's an extreme reluctance by providers to enter into episodes of care, bundled payments, upside downside risk, for the very reasons you've talked about. Yeah. Um, they get a revenue target approved by the GMCB. Um, it's a revenue stream. It's not, you know, it's really just once you have that approved target, you really don't want to move off of it so that the equation of value equals quality over cost times population, um, there's no real movement on the cost part. So how would you, how would, how would you get around that conundrum? And um, I mean, I think we need to say out loud that no one wants to be paid less money. I think member Yusufer <laughs> was raising that in her comment. Um, we as payers, are challenged because the providers have an extreme reluctance to move off of this 
to assume yeah. any sort of risk, despite what the GMCB and the all-payer model are really pushing, which is movement towards that, and it's been pushed for years. Well, first of all, thanks for joining on the call. Appreciate your comments. I mean, I, I look at it and, and say, if 58% of my outpatient revenue is 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 this is this tied to the fee for service, you know, uh, for most for the most part, um, and 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 every time I generate additional fee for service uh, outpatient revenue, um, and as a rural provider, if only 15% of my costs are are variable, um, I. I'm going to be really reluctant to give that up because that's my margin. And, and, and not only is it my margin, I'm going to create more of that. And so um, it, it, I just think it comes down to fundamental economics here that, that, and, and fixed variable costs equation. Um, and and to, 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 to take that leap and, and to say, I'm going to take less money um, you know, maybe you know, in Pennsylvania they don't necessarily have to take less money. I mean, that's so. so in Pennsylvania, the 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 equation is you get last year what you actually got paid by Blue Cross Blue Shield, plus we're going to trend that forward at inflation for the you know um, um, and and set you you know so, so your target for for 2020 was 18 trended forward to 19 trended forward to 20 based on inflation. So you're not going to get less money, and and maybe that's what we got to say. But we've got to change the dynamics of the payment so that on the income statement of these provider organizations, that that claims isn't going to drive um, the economic incentives. That is my fundamental belief. It ties back to everything that I'm I'm passionate about in this in in, in helping you know kind of solve some of this this these these these, these issues. Okay, next we're going to move to Ham Davis. Thanks, Kevin. Uh, I'd like to have a personal note here of it. when, uh, when uh, right after uh, Eric came over two years ago or three years ago, whenever it was, um, um, I was fascinated then. So I went over to South Portland, Maine, and spent half a day with him, and um, and uh, it was very illuminating. I've been doing this since 1980, probably longer than anybody else. I've talked to people from one coast to the other to the middle, okay, and I learned more in that afternoon hanging out at his conference room than I did in all the than in any long period in the rest of my career. So given that, I want to ask I've got some questions, a couple of questions for for uh, a comment for Eric. One is that one is that the um, it seems to me that the your, your fire hose. Uh, didn't have enough volume. If you, 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 would, you would be astonished, people would be astonished who heard your, your uh, statement today that in the la if you were to vote on the question of whether we should, yesterday in Vermont using whoever you want, the legislature, the governor's office, you name it, including very significantly in this board, people hate one care. They hate it. They hate it because it's run by one, by University of Vermont partly, okay? And they are they they just want no part of it. For example, you heard the governor, but what the governor's position has been is that the gov that the secretary the uh, secretary of the Agency of Human Services has said he's going to reboot One Care and he's got a 19 point plan, 19 points to fix all of the horrible problems with One Care. So that's just. A Here's my question in a quick one, but it gets at what I think is the issue here. If you have, do you believe, if you look at Vermont with all its small hospitals, you think that very small hospitals, including critical access hospitals, should be doing things like spine surgery, spine surgery, including fusion, um, with tiny volume? Do you think that they should be that they should be doing um, vascular surgery in, in in places like that, that they should be doing hip replacement. Do we need this Vermont with 600,000 people? Does it need 12 hospitals doing hip replacement? That's my question. <laughs> that's what the, most of these questions that you've heard, Eric, that's what it's basically about. 
because the small hospitals believe that if they do if they do this kind of reform, that they will they will that, that they cannot survive that in the form that they are now, and it will cost them a lot of money. So, first of all, you're far too kind and coming over here um, to spend time with you. That you know, uh, two years ago was a true honor. So I learned as much as 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 you allege that you did. So. Um, uh, you, you know, the comments around um, One Care Vermont, um, you know, a couple of things. One is that that I, I really like the aggregating payment source. Um, um, again, you know, let the commercial health plans compete on, on plan design and those types of things. But having that one aggregated payment, so it's a consistent payment, makes sense. If that's One Care Vermont, that's One Care Vermont. Um, if it's something else, it's something else. But you guys have the infrastructure in place already, and it's called One Care Vermont. Now, I did mention that I do think it has to have a different or a governance structure. Um, and it's, that governance structure has to be tweaked if this is going to be successful. And yeah. I'm sure there's people on on um, <laughs> One Care Vermont kind of not happy with me making that statement. But this just gets back to this this you know all knowing. Uh, a president that sits on the top of a payment system aggregator and distributor uh, has to have a, a wider voice than just those provider organizations. So, 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 you know, that's the comment there. With regard to your comment around should rural hospitals be doing all of the things that you um, say, say that they're doing? Um, Obviously, I'm I'm an accountant. I'm not a I'm not a clinician, and um, but I know there's lots of studies that would say that that small volumes is um, in in for certain services is is not not optimal. Um, I I do think though though this fee for service payment system has has created huge incentives um, to for developing programs like that just to keep the doors open. So again, as we start to aggregate payment and we can decide, you know, this is that all knowing president at Kaiser or whatever that that ultimately sits down with the community and the resources to be and decides where's investment in healthcare and where's investment in sick care and where are those investments most appropriate. Um, and I think that there's a resource allocation decision in, that, that that should be made. So, but I ho hope I answered a quarter of your questions. Thank you. Okay, other public comment? Uh, Michael Costa. Uh, good afternoon, Michael Costa, CEO of Northern Counties Healthcare. Uh, thank you so much for sharing your time and your expertise with us as we're all working on this project. I guess the, the one question I would have, you've referred several times to sort of the all-knowing uh, oh. here on top of this, making resource allocation decisions. At that point, what is the role of the board of directors at Vermont's hospitals, FQHCs, et cetera? How do you balance that role that you envision with notions of local control and the fiduciary obligations of local boards? Thank yeah. you. Yeah, so so it's a great, great question. And, and I definitely hear you. Um, Again, so so what I was trying to do was put Vermont into that vision that 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 they came up with on the plane to, to uh, Hawaii several years ago, um, and 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 you know, kind of creating a centralized force for decision making in terms of resource allocations. Um, in the larger systems, um, you know, most of the rural communities have a board that 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 is advisory board and provides those types of things. I mean. Um, you know, I don't know if we could ever have, and it's probably not likely um, having, you know, kind of an, an ACO, One Care Vermont, be the board, the governance board for all of the independent rural hospitals. Um, in other states, what's happening is, and and is that, that, that hospitals in North Carolina, I think there's two independent rural hospitals anymore. They're all getting rolled up into the systems. In Iowa, they're all getting rolled up into Unity Point or um, you know the, the the Catholic system there. I mean, they're all the hospitals are getting rolled up. Um, Vermont, you guys haven't had the need to do that because you have an aggregating source and a centralized decision making that isn't hospital centric, and so you, you're you're dealing with a very un Vermont's a very unusual uh, beast here. Um, um, 
I would like to think that, that there's still a significant governance function for each of those rural hospitals. But again, that aggregating force is 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 kind of what we got to have. And, um, you know, may, maybe let me let me go with this. I mean, may, maybe it's just around alignment with the ACO and alignment is functional governance and, and contractual alignment with the ACO that still allows the rural hospitals to have their full governance but we create full alignment with the ACO where you don't have to give up the, 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 the soul of your rural hospital, but you can still create that aligning force, that centralizing force um, that, that we're gonna have to have for decision making. I, you know what, I, I, I ultimately, uh, Michael, I think if we can get the payment fixed, then we can really start envisioning what this could really look like. And, and so, you know, my whole advocacy here and, and the, 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 the core of my talk is around figuring out how best to get the payment system changed. If we can do that, that frees us to think very differently about the future. Okay, other public comment? Uh, yes, Senator Lyons, welcome. Uh, thank you very much. And Eric, thank you so much for being here today. Um, I really, I, I have many questions. Some have already been asked. And as you know, we continue in the legislature to evaluate, uh, to look how, look at how we can take, what steps we can take forward. And one of the things that um, I think is critically important is transparency. So the the transparency of uh, payment reform, no. and which then extends to the transparency of private insurer contracts. I just maybe make a couple of comments about that. That that's just one of a thousand questions that I have. But I really uh, I do appreciate everything that you said, and I do hope that going forward, that uh, the legislature and our legislative work uh, can remain connected with you and the Green Mountain Care Board. So thank you. And thank well, you, Chair Mullen, for the shout out. <laughs> well deserved. <laughs> well, the, the, the beauty of, of, of what you have going on, Senator, is, is that there is transparency in, in, in payment for the most part. And, and, and that is something to your credit. So um, does that have to accelerate? Um, possibly, but you do have pretty significant transparency. And thanks for your comments. Well, I guess the question about transparency is more to the point. More to the point is that currently we have the bifurcation of um, our all payer and fee for service, and that we have the ACO making some decisions about the um, payment per member per month. But at the same time, we have negotiated agreements between hospitals and, and private insurers and private insurers and or companies, as you mentioned, ESI, so that, that there, therein lacks the transparency, except perhaps as rates are set at the Green Mountain Care Board, they're, they're not exactly determined, but they're set so so it gets to be more complex i i agree i mean yeah. you guys you yeah. guys no thank you i it's yeah. not a it's not an answerable yeah it's, 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 a, it's you guys have been dealing with this for uh let's see 2001 minus 2003 um it's been a while and 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 um we're not there yet Thank you, Senator Lyons. Uh, next, I'm going to call on the healthcare advocate, Mike Fisher. Um, good afternoon, Eric. Thanks for the presentation. Uh, yes, Mike Fisher here from the Healthcare Advocates Office. Um, I, I guess I just want to make the point or, or sort of link uh, to something that Member Yusufer said or the point she made about the flow of money that other people have recognized the, uh, that the providers need the revenue. Um, I wanted to make the link to the very beginning of your presentation about the rate of growth of um, premiums. And I also appreciate, thank you for also including the rate of growth in out-of-pocket e exposure yeah. uh, and just recognize the, the link between those two issues. 
between those two factors. Uh, you, we're not going to keep raising the, uh, the amount of money going to providers um, without having a, a bad impact uh, on, on premiums and therefore access to care on that side. And I welcome any comments you have on that, but I, I just wanted, really wanted to link those two things. I, I completely agree. I mean, and, and the comment I made was, at, at what point have we taken too much of the GDP? Um, you know, now the market's starting to solve this, uh, unfortunately, and um, which is is that call to action around the, the triple storm of 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 of, of um, the emergence of technology, the pandemic, which is now making technology, especially the telehealth type of features, and and um, and and the cost or the, the the total price. It's it's the market is starting to insert itself in as a supply. Uh, to the healthcare equation. So, um, you know, I, I say the faster we take responsibility for this and 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 we have an opportunity to, I, I, I don't know, I, I hate to say withhold some of that more uh, market forces, but it's going to be a tough one. Oh. Thank you. Okay, other public comment? Hearing none and seeing no hands raised, I want to uh, once again thank you, Eric. Um, it's been a very good discussion that uh, um, has uh, ensued out of your uh, presentation this morning, and we really appreciate you um, um, spending time and uh, taking a look at the state of Vermont. And um, I just want to say that hopefully the next time Ham goes over, he buys you a nice dinner. Uh, <laughs> And with that, I'm going to place this meeting in recess until one o'clock this afternoon. Thank you, everyone. See you at one. Coffee, Thank you, Kevin. <laughs> Dinner, Ham. <laughs> Not your coffee. <laughs>